So we have the combination of Jeremy Clarkson talking about it on a show that was the biggest show in the world, and everybody else wanting to be Jeremy Clarkson, an island full of Clarksons, if you will, and this car, well, went into the annals of history as one of the worst flappy paddles of all time. Is it deserved? I don't think so. One Mississippi. Onomatopoeia. Hippopotamoniosis. I, I guess I can say pretty high syllable words in between shifting, but it is really, really not that bad. Welcome to Hoobie's Garage, the dumbest automotive channel in all of YouTube. And my latest purchase, or really trade, should look familiar to you because it is indeed the Car Trek Vanquish. It is a 2003 Aston Martin Vanquish that we used in Car Trek 2. Ed Bullion of Vinwiki bought it for less than $30,000. It spent a lot of time in Columbia, the country, but no drugs were found. And then he sold it to Freddie before I could stake my claim to it. Freddie bought it for around $37,000. And at the time, I was quite angry because it was the first time Ed Bullion had really given away a car. He was kind of delirious in the record heat that summer in Las Vegas, like 120 degrees, literally. And he was sweating it out in this thing with bad air conditioning, badly misfiring. And he sold it for maybe a slight loss to Freddie. And I was so jealous, especially after he sold me a very broken Mercy Lago and he made $30,000 thousand dollars off of me on that sale or maybe more i've heard different numbers over the years but in the two years since on this car trek i have been a very very patient man waiting patiently for my turn to reclaim this car that i have always wanted and it finally happened with a very very broken audi r8 if you all don't recall i bought this audi r8 for my wife for christmas and i was told by the seller it ran and drove and it showed up uh, not running and driving. It indeed needed an engine because it was way out of time and I was quoted, well, over $20,000, close to $30,000 to fix it on a vehicle that I was $45,000 invested to with accident history with, uh, you know, kind of sketchy odometer reporting and uh, decent but sketchy condition, which realistically would have me almost $80,000 into a V8 R8 with that kind of history. It made no sense. But when I had that car, it was kind of like bait for Tavarsh. I knew he wanted it. He emailed me almost immediately talking about how much he wanted it. And rather than sell it to him, I said, well, I do covet your vanquish, good sir. And this car, thankfully, he hadn't done anything with because of the reason why these are so cheap. And well, here it is. I traded him my R8. I gave him $10,000 on top of that. And I gave him back the Pimp My Ride van as sort of a tip so he wouldn't complain. And now, <laughs> it's mine. So not only is it mine, but it's actually mine at a pretty decent price considering today's market. So let's say $55,000 into this V12 Vanquish. And really that's about the going rate, but it's better than losing 10 or $20,000 selling off that Audi R8 uh, with all those problems. So thank you again for that, Freddie. But really that's all probably this car is worth given its story and history, 27 or 8,000 miles on it. So not too bad on the miles. And that really is a crime, honestly. Originally, this car was close to a quarter of a million dollars. They only built 2,500 of these, and it celebrated really the return of Aston Martin to its greatness, building exceptional, hand-built, amazing cars. And the greatness and the specialness of this car has been sort of overshadowed by subsequent Aston Martin models that look, well, a lot like this, but they aren't nearly as special, not to mention being a Bond car, which you all know I have the Z8. I now have two Brosnan Bond cars, the best ones. The other reason why these are so cheap, well, it's the transmission that's inside of it that's been mocked for decades thanks to one man, really the biggest automotive influencer in the world and my personal idol, but in this case, I'm gonna have to knock him a little bit. But before we get into the one review and foible of this car that ruined its reputation and sent resale values plummeting, a little bit of history. In the late 80s, Aston Martin was on life support. They were only building a few hundred cars, if that, per year, and they were having trouble selling those. So Ford bought them out along with Jaguar, and Ian Callum pinned a design to continue the Jaguar brand, and well, Ford thought, well, that would look a lot better on an Aston Martin, so it ended up being the DB7, although they didn't update the underneath. Now, I'm a fan of the DB7, but it is basically a horse and buggy underneath. They continue the old XJS kind of chassis suspension setup and put a beautiful modern body on it, but it was a pretty lazy touring car. Under the hood was an inline six that was supercharged from a Jaguar, but a few years later, they brought up this V12 
that is under the hood. And then a few years after, Aston Martin finally got a car worthy of its name, not sort of a rebadge rehash of an existing Jaguar, and that was this, the V12 Vanquish. In person, it is so much cooler looking than the DB7 or a DB9 or pretty much any Aston Martin that replaced it. The hips on this thing are so wide, the front end treatment, just so, so cool. And even though it looks like every other Aston Martin sort of in general principle, for the next 15 years, I think this is the best looking one of the bunch and it is pretty much the original. I mean, look at this rear quarter section right here. Now, Aston Martin made about 2,500 of these and priced them around $230,000 to be competitive with the Ferrari 575. And well, uh, they immediately depreciated. It's not hard to find one of these for 50 or $60,000 nowadays, even in today's crazy, crazy market, whereas a 575 is a $100,000 car or more. Another comparable, let's say the Murcielago, the early ones, the Coupes, they had a $280,000 MSRP, maybe it was in the high 260s, and now they're, well, worth about half that, I suppose, but not as bad as the Aston Martin, where it's worth a quarter of that or less. And that's why Ed picked this for the Car Trek 2 challenge of buying the most depreciated exotic that we could find. Now, I sort of won that in, in every kind of way, the most depreciated car with the CL65 AMG V12 twin turbo, and a lot of the challenges, I ended up winning the Trek, but really, everybody wanted the V12 Vanquish. Literally everybody, because all three of us have owned it at this point. And yes, Ed bought it for less than $30,000, probably the cheapest one to transact ever, but it showed up with a bad clutch, which was monstrously expensive, more expensive than Lamborghini clutches. I think they're over $3,000 just for that part. And numerous other issues that weren't really corrected by the time Car Trek rolled around and he struggled through the entire thing. Now, Freddie bought it. The wizard actually inspected it during the Trek, so I had that peace of mind for the first time. We're actually going to go back up there today because it's been two years since then, but Freddie has fixed a lot of things, including the brakes. I'm sure it wasn't cheap. Now, I know one of them did a tune-up on it, changed the spark plugs. It is running a lot better than it was in the desert. And other little here's and there's, the wheels are aftermarket. The original ones were bent, probably being in Columbia with the terrible roads, but these, I really don't mind them. I think they look fantastic. The whole car needs a clean, but otherwise it is in very, very nice shape. And coming from a DB7 and a DB9 recently, a Rapide, this thing just feels more special for a lot of reasons inside and out. Oh, there's still my junk in here. But you can kind of see the detail in the interior with the door panel. This is real metal, real metal surrounding the speakers. You can see it's a fantastic stereo system. The seats well, certainly look their age. They look like the mid 2000s, but uh, in the back you can see no back seat. But that rear parcel shelf with that factory stereo, look at that giant subwoofer there that is adjustable. This interior is just so dang cool. Let down a little bit by these plasticky buttons. The start button is nice though, and this Jaguar climate control system. The quality does go back up though with this being metal, and this I imagine is supposed to open, but it doesn't. The stereo certainly looks nice. And then these grab handles, they are metal. You see there's no gear selector. It is a automated manual transmission where a flappy paddle gearbox is the man himself, Jeremy Clarkson, coined the phrase, a suede headliner. But let me tell you, this car, it just feels so much more special than any other Aston Martin that I've owned. It honors the heritage of the brand much more than say the Aston Martins that have replaced it and since they're now AMG powered vehicles now. They're really, really cool, but it's not the same as this. And really, well, that's the reason why Aston Martin went bankrupt or close to it so many times is because they would build cars like these where there was no bean counter telling them to not do that. But really we should thank the cars that were built by bean counters because the DB7 obviously saved Aston Martin as a brand, proved it to be, well, it could be viable again, and they were able to build this. And of course we saw the return of Aston Martin to Bond movies that was so important with this one in Die Another Day, rescuing Halle Berry from the ice hotel and that ice race with the Jaguar XKR chasing it. Was it a particularly great Bond movie? No, but I was entertained by it, same with The World Is Not Enough and the Z8, not the greatest Bond movie, but very entertaining, very fun. And unlike the Z8 that got sawed in half, the Vanquish had a lot more screen time and, well, really did save the day. Cloaking device, that kind of stuff. So for so many reasons, in my eyes, this is such an undervalued, underappreciated car. If you take the Z8, for example, that's now a $200,000 plus vehicle with low mileage. Where is this? I was waiting for the transmission to shut up, whereas this is just criminally cheap, basically like a mid-level Ford F-150 cheap. And well, we all know why. Yep, 
these things, but in my opinion, it is one of the biggest automotive fish stories ever. Up there with like Porsche IMS bearings or Mercedes AMG 6.3 head bolts. It's gotten so crazy over the years, so blown out of proportion with so few people actually experiencing the car firsthand to make their own opinions that, well, it's just ridiculous and it's why these are so cheap. But today we are setting the record straight. Starting the V12 Vanquish, you put in the Jaguar key that is barely disguised, put it in neutral, both flappies and then engine start. Feels special, doesn't it? Next, I'm gonna hit the sport button, which is what you should do immediately because it makes all of it so much better. Then first gear and we're off. And guess what? The world is not coming to an end. The clutch engaged smoothly. It's fine. But let's get to the part where Jeremy Clarkson absolutely hated this thing. All right, let's accelerate and shift. Now, does that seem slow to you? Does that seem terrible? Especially keeping in mind, this is 20 years old, this technology at this point. And I wasn't lifting off the gas at all. I was just flapping the paddle like I would in my Lamborghini or any other car. One Mississippi. On a monopia. Hippopotamoniosis. I guess I can say pretty high syllable words in between shifting, but it is really, really not that bad. All it took for this car to have this reputation is a review by one man, Jeremy Clarkson, who drove this thing in top gear, complaining about all the flappy paddle gearboxes that were coming out, drove this thing to a boat ramp and floor reversed it up the boat ramp trying to turn around just to show how terrible it was. But really, I broke traction there a little bit. That was the traction control. But really try doing that in a manual transmission on a steep hill, a boat ramp like that, and you'll struggle just as hard. Yes, it can feel clumsy at times, and yes, it doesn't always do what you want it to do, but the same goes for any manual transmission driver. You always make a mistake. But if you had a normal slush box car, you wouldn't be having this much fun. And I think the other issue was people buying these, expecting them to drive like an automatic or hitting that horrible automatic. Why did that Volkswagen not get over? That's ridiculous. Anyway, hitting that automatic button and thinking it would act like an automatic transmission, but really it just acts like a child learning how to drive a manual transmission. So the automatic mode is terrible, but the rest of it's not that far off of a Ferrari or a Lamborghini of the era. So we have the combination of Jeremy Clarkson talking about it on a show that was the biggest show in the world and everybody else wanting to be Jeremy Clarkson, an island full of Clarksons, if you will. And this car, well, went into the annals of history as one of the worst flappy paddles of all time. Is it deserved? I don't think so. I really, really don't think so. And in today's world of lightning fast dual clutch cars, does it really matter? I mean, honestly, does it matter? Do I wish this car had a manual transmission? Well, absolutely, of course. And that's what Jeremy Clarkson was complaining about. Give him the power to control the gears and do what he wants with the clutch and all that stuff. And I did agree with him in that respect. And Aston Martin, well, apparently agreed with him in retrospect as well, because they do offer a service to convert these things to a manual transmission. Costs around $50,000, $60,000, not including shipping. And you get a car back with completely transformed. They do a whole new center console, change a lot of things to make it a proper manual, but man, oh man, is it expensive. Now, Freddie's original intent, Tavares, when he bought this car, was to convert it over himself, but I don't think Aston Martin will sell him the parts, so he'd have to figure it out on his own. And while that's far from impossible from him, it's quite a feat. This thing sat for a few years because of it, but I think when he got his manual DBS, that really changed his tune because, well, there it was right there, a manual Aston Martin V12, almost as pretty as this in my opinion. So basically this car was waiting for me. Now, I hadn't driven one of these in a very, very long time. I didn't drive this one because it was so hot in Vegas and it was dying in it and just melting his goo and things into the seat that I didn't want to sit in it. Now that I say that, I doubt this car has been clean since then. But anyway, I got this thinking, well, maybe I will send it off to England to get it manual swap, to get that all converted. And then I do get the money back. The cars are worth 
at least what you put into them to make them a manual. But now that I have it, I don't want to do it. This really, really isn't that bad. Is that a Supra? Anyway, I do feel like there will be a time where people do figure this out, figure out how special these cars are. It's a carbon fiber chassis this thing sits on, even though it is very, very heavy. Low production, one of the most beautiful cars of all time, 460 horsepower V12. I feel like the secret, it can't stay a secret for that much longer. This thing is just too good. But maybe the car wizard will disagree with me when he looks at it again two years later. I know he liked it back then, but Will he like it today? And I know he has worked on a few of these before, so maybe his opinion on these mechanically will change our tune a little bit, but right now, there's no way. Wizard! I brought back an old friend. I think I've seen this one before. You, you, you've seen it? Yes. It shut up. Sorry, it's it's a little talkative. You've seen it. You've been under it, and you gave it a pretty decent bill of health once before two years ago. Right. And since then, it's actually gotten better. Freddie, you had fixed the brakes. You had mentioned the brakes were really. You probably don't remember because you do so many inspections, so many cars. Mm -hmm. It's but been a while. I, I watched the video again because I didn't remember. There weren't any leaks. You just said the brakes were really thin, and there was a code for an oxygen sensor, which mm -hmm. I think is fixed. But now. The check engine light is flashing. It goes away sometimes, but then I can tell it's sputtering every once in a while. It's very intermittent. And then sometimes another thing, the coolant low warning comes on and uh, well, the coolant's not low. It just pops on sometimes, scares me, but it seems fine. Okay. Well, we could scan the code real quick to see what it says before we get it on a lift and look at it. Sure, but let's pop the hood first. Okay. I didn't show it in my garage at home because I was saving it for you. But look at this, another way this thing looks so special, the engine bay presentation on these. See this crossbar with this old school carbon fiber mesh? Beautiful. And it has like little tubas that let heat out of the top. Yeah, so the, there's a heat shield around the uh, headers and they vent out into the hood, which mm -hmm. makes it functional. But otherwise, the same V12 that Aston Martin used for a long time, two Ford Taurus V6s glued together to create uh, actually a pretty good engine. Yeah, they re it really are a good engine, thanks to uh, this guy here. Ah, yes, final inspection by Thomas Clark. He inspected well. It's held up decently, considering the life it's had. Mm -hmm. So it looks the same as two years ago. Anything new you're seeing that's wrong? No. Let's see well, the leaks. I'll take a look around the front here. I think it was dry last time and it's dry again. I guess we could check for codes and see what's going on there. Sounds good. What does that interior smell like to you? Kind of smells like Freddy's rear end. Well, or Ed's. I mean, he sweated so much in this car in Las Vegas. Oh, Ed's. 120 degree heat. Uh, yeah, a, a combination of both of their sweaty asses, yeah. Parf I, parfum de Ed. It, it needs a detail, for sure. Oof. So where's the OBD2 slot on this thing? Well, most cars are under here, somewhere under here, but actually this one, you remove this panel. Velcro? Am I here? I was talking about the quality of the interior. Uh, you know, Velcro's good quality. It works. The interior doesn't have any creaks or rattles, which is a testament to this thing, 20 years later. So it says there are five codes in this thing. Oh. Read the codes, please. Cylinder one misfire. Cylinder two, cylinder three. Random misfire. Cylinder four. And the O2 sensor code is still there. Ah. Indicates lean is what it says. Yeah, so that might be just from the misfires. Okay. So you think uh, a tune-up's in order for this thing? I think so, and you know that's not going to be cheap. <laughs> no, I have actually had to do that a few times now. And it requires removing all this beautifulness here, removing the intakes to get to the ignition coils and the spark plugs. And the coils themselves are very expensive. It's like twelve or fourteen hundred dollars because they're Aston Martin specific, and a lot of them. So three grand. And then there's the coolant level thing, which you know how much that is. Usually just the sensor. Well, if it's just the sensor or the reservoir, it could be five hundred dollars or more. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe 
pretty, uh, <laughs> we just kind of flung turds at each other from across the country, huh? Yeah, you just kind of swapped them there. We did, we just we flung the poo. So um, I was gloating a little too much in the garage, so maybe this is kind of karma biting me back, but I knew what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. Hopefully there's nothing else though. We'll get up on the lift and make sure, huh? Let's do it. Not normally an aftermarket wheel fan or black wheels, but I like those. Yeah. You like them? They look good with the color there. All right. Well, there is some wetness going on though. Uh, what? It wasn't like, okay, is that oil? It seems like it. Let's see if I can peek through some of these hidey holes here. I don't see anything there. Could be something simple as they did an oil change and got it all over the place or We'll have to pull down all these panels. That's what these cars are all about on the bottom, is panels on top of panels. Yeah. Look at all these bolts. Well, even the transmission is protected. Yep. It's part of the structure. If you took this panel off and drove it around, it could be dangerous for the car. Well, there's the uh, spaghetti monster that controls the transmission, I imagine, huh? Yep. How about that? It's a little seepage right there, but nothing serious. Not yet, anyway. Yeah, well, that seems like a pretty minor oil leak. Yeah, it's minor. Whatever it is, it's small. Okay. And going back, it's... <laughs> it's all just... Bonded, all bonded structure. See this orange here? Mm -hmm. That's actually adhesive, like a hard plastic to glue together. Yeah, but then you have pretty easy jack points on this thing. Yeah. But really not a lot to see. They no. were thinking about aerodynamics as much on, underneath this thing as they were on top of it. Whereas... Yeah. Earlier, Aston Martin, sorry about your head there. Hit my head. We're kind of just worried about what was on top, like with the DB7. We went and looked underneath, and it looked like a ancient 1970s vehicle, whereas this, this could look like something from 2022, honestly. It could. Everything's dry on that wheel. Over there as well. Yeah. Whatever's going on with the leak, I think it's minor. All right, well, I'm spending some money anyway. Another tune-up on another Aston Martin. I need to quit selling these things and actually keep them because I, I fix all this stuff and then sell it, and then I have to do the tune-up again. Uh, the coolant thing, definitely want to fix that. Mm -hmm. It's annoying. And then I guess you'll let me know when you get all the panels off to do the oil change on what's going on underneath. Fingers crossed there. But I think I did well. I, I needed to get rid of that Audi R8, obviously. I definitely would take this over the R8 any day. I gave him 10 grand on top, too. You did? I did. Yeah. I don't know about that. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence, Wizard, and thank you so much for watching. <laughs> this thing's worth a lot of money. Okay, maybe so.